Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines Protesters arrested in Myanmar as anti coup resistance grows. Canada designates far right Proud Boys group as a terrorist entity. Palestine begins administering COVID 19 vaccines amid shortages. And finally, in our video section, we look at changes in the Sudanese government and their implications for the 2018 revolutionary agenda. In our first story, at least three people were arrested after a protest against a military coup in Myanmar today. Amid growing civilian resistance, the military has blocked Facebook and restricted other social media platforms till February 7th. Activists have launched a civil disobedience movement campaign starting February 3rd. Healthcare workers in over 70 hospitals across 30 towns also went on strike on Wednesday. Doctors, nurses and other workers have stopped work, stating that they will not obey orders from the illegitimate military regime. Workers in the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Irrigation reportedly also joined the civil disobedience movement today, media reports said. People have also protested by banging pots and pans for the past two nights in Yangon. Depot State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi is now facing charges of violating import and export laws and possessing unlawful communications devices. Burmese police filed the charges on February 3rd and have remanded Suu Kyi in custody till February 15th. The ousted president, Win Mint, has also been placed under custody for two weeks for violating COVID guidelines against public gatherings. Both Suu Kyi and Mint have been detained at an unconfirmed location since the military coup on February 1st. The military has imposed a state of emergency for one year and all power has been handed over to the commander-in-chief. The military has also established a state administrative council consisting of 11 members. The SAC has appointed new election commissioners as well as the governor of the central bank. Lawmakers from Suki's National League for Democracy party were ordered by the military yesterday to vacate their residences in the national capital within 24 hours. However, according to the BBC, at least 70 lawmakers have refused to leave a government guest house and have declared that they will call a new parliamentary session. In our next story, the Canadian federal government has designated a far-right white supremacist group Proud Boys as a banned terrorist organization. Twelve other groups were added to the list on February 3rd, as the government stated that right-wing extremist ideology posed a threat to domestic security. The Public Safety Department issued a statement announcing that each group met the legal threshold as specified in Canada's criminal code. The move to place the Proud Boys on the terrorist list was a result of a unanimous resolution in the Canadian Parliament in January. Public Safety Minister Bill Blair also acknowledged the racist, anti-Semitic and misogynistic politics of the group. The Proud Boys have actively mobilized racist, anti-black protests in the US. They were also part of the mob that attacked the US Capitol building on January 6th. Two members of the organization have been charged in relation to the riot so far. A terrorist designation in Canada means that the government can restrict the activities of a specified organization. The government can also impose penalties, withdraw charitable status and restrict the movement of those associated with the organization. Canada is the first country to list Proud Boys as a terrorist entity. We now go to Palestine where the health ministry has started administering COVID-19 vaccines in part of the occupied territories governed by the Palestinian Authority. The announcement was issued on February 2nd after Palestine received 2,000 doses of the vaccine on Monday. Though the government is hoping to receive 50,000 additional doses from other sources, this would still leave a majority of around 5 million Palestinians at risk. Israel's decision to provide only 5,000 doses of the Moderna vaccine to Palestinian frontline workers has been widely criticized. This denial of adequate vaccines will worsen the conditions in the occupied territories, which have already recorded 180,000 cases so far. Here is Abdul Rahman of People's Dispatch to talk about the barriers to vaccine procurement faced by Palestine. Palestine is a country of around 5 million people. In, uh, we are talking about West Bank and Gaza, two occupied territories, we are, uh, which are basically governed by the Palestinian Authority. And the health, health infrastructure under the Palestinian Authority is not good for the reasons which are quite obvious. The occupying forces, which means Israel, has uh, systematically destroyed the health infrastructure in the country. And uh, because of the destruction and because of the lack of the fund, which is tightly controlled by the uh, Israeli uh, occupation forces, the, uh, the overall situation of the health infrastructure is really bad in the country. Uh, even during the pandemic, when the pandemic was uh, uh, on, and even now, the, when the lockdown is going on, Israel has cons constantly attacked the uh, the health infrastructure, and there has been a UN report which says that uh, how in the last two uh, last year, basically, Israel has increased those attacks, despite the fact that there is a uh, pandemic going on. In that context, uh, <clears throat> uh, in in this context, if we see the, the outbreak of COVID, which is uh, which has impacted very badly in both 
West Bank and Gaza, more than 160,000 people have been infected and more than 1,800 uh, 1, people have died because of this uh, uh, disease. Uh, even uh, during that, when the vaccination started, Israelis uh, denied, continuously denied uh, Palestinian authority the access to vaccination, which has led to the allegations by the Palestinian activists, by the uh, international human rights organizations, even the Israeli human rights organizations, uh, that Israel is practicing what is called the vaccine apartheid or the medical apartheid vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians. Uh, Israel has an obligation under the Geneva Convention uh, that the, the occupied territories, it has to provide for the health infrastructure for the occupied territories, which it has completely failed to do. Uh, and uh, when uh, Palestinian authorities approved the vaccine, Sputnik, Russian vaccine, because it was not approved by Israelis, they did not let Palestinian authority buy it. Even Palestinians, Palestinians want to buy something, the Israelis do not uh, let them buy it. And after a lot of pressure, the Israelis finally agreed to give them only 5,000 vaccine uh, uh, for a population of 5 million, only 5,000 vaccines. And that too will be, uh, as per the decisions, will be given to Palestinians in phases. Right now, only 2,000 vaccines have been given with, with which the Palestinian Authority has started vaccination. And we don't know what the other vaccines, when will, when will they arrive? The, according to the Palestinian uh, Health Ministry, there will be 50,000, so far, there are 50,000 vaccines which have been assured from different sources, most of which will come with uh, the, the COVAX International uh, Initiative. Uh, and even, but the dates of that is not final. The primary, uh, the Palestinian Authority wants to vaccinate at least 70% of the population so that there is some level of resistance developed among the people, which, which as, as if now looks very difficult given the fact that Israel is not cooperating, a country which itself is the leading, vac which is leading the countries in the world in vaccination. Uh, it has vaccinated almost 33% of its population so far, uh, is not letting the Palestinians, which are under their uh, its occupation, uh, 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 letting them ac have access to vaccines. This particular phrase, this particular uh, situation has been termed by the Palestinian activists at vaccine apartheid. For our final story today, we go to Sudan, where the transitional government is set to initiate a reshuffling of the cabinet and the sovereignty council. As per the 2019 agreement between the transitional military council and the civilian forces of freedom and change, an interim legislative council will also be set up. These upcoming changes follow massive protests for democratic reforms across Sudan in December 2020. Here is Dr. Fatih El Fath from the Sudanese Communist Party to talk about the upcoming changes and their impact on the 2018 revolution's agenda. When they are speaking now about forming a government within uh, the force of uh, February or even uh, establishing the uh, this body by the 25th of February, I don't think this, first of all, this is a clear violation of the constitutional uh, document which was adopted uh, in uh, the period after the overthrow of al-Bashir. And they are going with, I mean, this new alliance between uh, the military in the Sovereignty Council, the representative of this so-called revolutionary front of the rebel groups, plus three political parties. This is the, uh, uh, the basis, the basis mainly, Sudan, the Sudan Congress and the National Union. These three parties are the real parties and uh, having this new alliance uh, today, which is proposing these new uh, steps to establish a cabinet and so on and so forth. So our position is that this is now, it is a, they are trying to use the quota principle to distribute offices of the uh, cabinet uh, ministries among themselves, to add some people to the uh, sovereignty council, uh, maybe to appoint uh, new uh, uh, governors for the uh, uh, the different uh, provinces and so on and so forth away from the main trend within the street because there is a real contradiction existing now in the Sudan between the uh, the forces who are seeking a radical change in the country and are mainly represented uh, within the 
the committees, uh, uh, the, 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 the resistance committees, and the trade union, the professional, uh, uh, I mean, these are the forces which are today fighting against uh, these proposals of 4th of, April, uh, 4th of uh, February and so on. So I don't envisage, because they have their own plan, which means they are changing everything which was adopted uh, earlier within the constitutional uh, document and the political document to suit the new alliance. And in a sense, that means a real betrayal of the revolution. That's why today, for example, we are calling for a change in, the, in, in power, that we, we are fighting to establish a broad uh, front to change the, the balance of forces first, and second, really to, to, to establish a government which represents the aspiration of the people. We don't expect uh, the formation of any government or sovereignty uh, council, which they will add two or three from the rebel group, and they will change some of the civilians and so on, will really affect the policies being implemented in the country. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch. Thank you.